So interestingly enough, I, I rarely participate in every curry night and I, I appreciate they are the reason why we have won so many championships. We have two questions that link together very nicely. One was why did we run the medium tyre in qualifying three? And the second was how and why did we set the fastest lap in qualifying in Q2 and on the medium tyre? A little bit of history, if you look back at 2020, we also used the medium there in qualifying three. Lewis did lap one, lap three and set the fastest time starting on pole. The medium and the soft in Portimao behave very, very similarly in terms of the ultimate grip that they can provide. They take a while to warm up and that's why you saw us doing preparation laps. We had to do a lap first of all that was slightly off the pace just to generate the tyre temperature and the second push lap. But when you've done that we found the, the grip between the medium and the soft was very, very similar and the balance very, very similar as well. So they were, for want of a better word, certainly interchangeable. That's not normal. Normally you've got a few tenths worth of grip advantage on that soft tyre, but also as you would recognise, normally the grip comes on that first lap and the out lap really is not as hard as that. You don't need to put as much energy in in order to extract the time. So why did we run the medium here in Q3? Simply, we saw our Q2 time, we saw the grip it could provide with a preparation lap and decided that we would try one of each tyre. We would run the soft first and evaluate where we were relative to Red Bull, where we were relative to qualifying two. And if we saw just a little bit of a dip of grip, we would put on the table that certainly the medium was a possibility and try that as the second run. After the first run, we weren't content that we were getting everything out of it, so decided to run the medium. With the benefit of hindsight, Q3 was just globally slower right at the end relative to qualifying two and even the beginning of qualifying three. And much of that was down to the wind conditions. The track temperature didn't really change much. There's a little bit of cloud cover and it moved in and out, but the wind was very, very gusty and very much had an impact on the times that cars were doing in Q3 relative to Q2. We've had a question come in around the wind and how it was in Portimao and what it does to the car. So the first thing to bring up is it was incredibly windy in Portimao. It's the, the worst conditions we've had so far this season. We had gusts of wind up to 40 kilometers an hour. Now, mostly, this was a headwind on the one down on the start finish straight, but it did rotate around a little bit. So if you start off with when it's gusty and not a constant wind, it's very difficult for the driver to predict what the car's going to do. It could be they've gone through one corner previously and the car's been absolutely fine, but on this attempt they've had a gust that's up to 40 kilometers an hour and it dramatically affects the car balance for them depending on the cornering speed. On the start finish straight, it could be that on one lap you're being slowed down enormously by a strong gust of wind and on the next the wind has died down and all of a sudden your straight line speed's much higher. And it can equate, in the case of Portimao, we saw swings of tenths forwards and backwards. That's why you saw qualifying move around so much. And from a driver's perspective, it becomes difficult to know what the car balance truly is. If we think about the wind, when it's pushing on you, it's a headwind in front of you, clearly it slows you down. It also helps you on turning to the corner. It creates front load and actually creates a safe balance for the car. When it's behind you, you obviously become much, much faster in the straight line, but equally it can cause you to have a very difficult balance on corner entry when the wind's pushing behind. It can cause effectively a snap of oversteer or otherwise, especially as I said before, if it's a gust of wind the driver's not expecting and he carries exactly the same apex speed as he did before. So that's how wind works and operates. Obviously, it's the same for everyone. But when it's in qualifying like that, it does actually cause you to mean that certain cars just a few seconds behind you on track could benefit by a few tenths if they're just lucky on a gust of wind or you're unlucky. Why did you pit for hards instead of stretching the stint out and fitting the soft tyre towards the end of the race? The soft tyre was able to provide a really good outlap. It was immediately up to temperature, near enough, relative to the hard tyre that was difficult to get working on that outlap and really took a lap, maybe two, to get properly into its temperature window. Part of the reason why is if we look at this theoretical time graph or strategy, you can see the blue line represents exactly this, the soft being fitted, but you have to stretch that stint out relative to the hard tyre that we fitted. And you can see even though you've got that big warm-up slope, the hard is actually a faster race by a few seconds, and we tend to optimise to that. Furthermore, the soft has a little bit of a weakness. It could grain and fall apart on the front axle, and we saw that happen with a number of cars in the race. Not everyone, and we even saw it happen on the medium tyre for a few competitors. As a result of that, you tend to fit the tyre that will give you the robustness that you know you can push on it if you're under pressure or you need to attack a car in front. So if we go through both of the races, let's start with Valtteri. 
Valtteri had done a great job and was still in that second position and, and just eked out just over a second gap relative to Verstappen behind. Now, we knew that at the lap that we were in the race, Verstappen wouldn't stop and fit soft tyres. That was far, far too long to go to the end of the race. And further proof of that was even at the end of the race when they fitted it to Perez, you could see that it dropped off quite significantly after he went for his fastest lap attempts. It's not a robust tyre, it's not a tyre that you could happily do 30 laps on without concerning yourself with. So with the lap that we were with Valtteri and with Verstappen, we knew that they'd stop and fit hard tyres and we knew it'd have a warm-up slope. And what we were banking on was that that warm-up slope would be significant enough that we could stop one lap later and come out ahead. And once you have a gap of around 1.3, 1.4 seconds, you can absorb some of that warm-up slope on the outlap and you'll be okay. Now, we, we misjudged that. The clear matter of fact is we didn't have enough tenths in hand to cope with everything that Valtteri had. His in that was just a little bit down and his pit lane time was very, very good, but you saw as he exited, he had a lot of wheel spin on that cold, hard tire and just unable to really get himself where he wanted to on track to defend that position whereas Verstappen now was on the tyres that were warm and he was good. As a result of that, whilst we came out on track ahead, with the small buffer we provided Valtteri, it wasn't enough to hold on to that position. Had we had just four tenths more in hand, I think he would have been okay and would have been able to hold on to it, but we didn't. And the truth behind that is the only fix would have been to stop Valtteri one lap earlier and try preemptively stop that undercut from happening. With Lewis, once Verstappen had stopped and Valtteri had stopped. With the stint that we had remaining, we went for the fastest race, which was the hard tyre. Now, what it meant was you wouldn't necessarily get a chance of fastest lap, but fastest lap wouldn't be done there anyway. As you've seen the last few races, there's always one of the teams that has an opportunity to stop and fit the softer compounds. So with Lewis, it was about fitting the same compounds as Max and as Valtteri behind and making sure we match what they do to the end of the race and go to the fastest strategy. What caused Valtteri to have a loss of power towards the end of the race and how did it repair itself? On lap 54 of the race, Valtteri coming to the start finish straight lost straight line speed, a significant amount of straight line speed, enough to lose a few seconds of race time. And that carried through into the following lap. We have a number of sensors all over the car, as you would imagine, but especially around the power unit. And there are sensors there to make sure we protect the power unit in case of trouble. In this case, the power unit actually was perfectly fine, but one of the sensors was reading very inaccurate numbers and put the engine into a protection mode, effectively try to, if this was true, protect the power unit. It's a power unit we have to run for a number of races. And after a short period of time, those two laps, the sensor actually failed, and as a result of it, the power unit returned back to normal power. There was nothing more that had to be done. We obviously also have, and we were looking through it at our disposition, a number of ways of modifying what the power unit does in terms of recovery strategy. So we have default modes that you may have heard call over the radio, which allow us to fix off specific sensors that may be troubled. Ultimately, this cost Valtteri any chance at all of getting back to second place. He had done to that point an incredible job to close the gap back down to Verstappen, and he was on his gearbox about to pressure him. In hindsight, do you think it was a mistake pitting Valtteri one lap earlier for fastest lap attempt? Short answer, yes. Um, the soft tyre was a difficult tyre to get working and more so we felt perhaps a couple of attempts at it would be on the safer side. It was foolish uh, and in truth we hadn't fully considered all the consequences of us stopping that much earlier, providing an opportunity for Verstappen to also stop. How's it going James? I mean, first of all, thank you. Uh, it's very rarely asked these days, unless you're in America. And to answer it, good. Uh, we had a bank holiday yesterday, and whilst there's always a bit of carryover work between two back-to-back -back races like this, you do get to spend a little bit of time at home, although, be it in my case, it was mostly watching um, patio furniture blow across the garden. Um, but good, uh, thank you for asking. What's your favorite curry? So interestingly enough, I, I rarely participate in every curry night and I, I appreciate they are the reason why we have won so many championships, but it's not necessarily the, the food that I would go to as a first port of call. But in Portimao, we had limited options. And indeed on Saturday, I, I partaked in the, the curry um, evening. My favorite curry is perhaps a 
one of the milder ones, I'm afraid, a korma or a butter chicken. And normally something I order under my breath, so most people don't hear what I'm particularly ordering at that stage. Um, I have a mild allergy to tomatoes, which means I've also got to contain myself within some of the food groups that I definitely know don't have tomato in. But typically a korma, which is, for example, what I had on Saturday night, a bit of mushroom rice and a kima naan, and that went down a treat. Thank you for all of your questions, and we'll be back in a week's time after the Spanish Grand Prix.